In 2015, she was one of Justin Trudeau's star candidates, taking her riding of Whitby from the Conservatives who had held it for a decade. Once in Ottawa, the new Prime Minister made Selena Caesar Chavan his parliamentary secretary. But before the Liberal Party's first mandate has run its course, she's left her post and the party caucus, announcing, too, that she will not be running in the upcoming federal election. And Selena Caesar Chavan joins us now on What Happened. Hi, Selena. Hi. Nice Neha. to see you. Um, I should say that we've known each other for a little bit. Yes, we um, have. And I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you for having me. But I will push back if I have to. I expect you to do your job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, That's sure. how we play. That's how we play. Um, you've only been an MP for four years. Yes. Uh, what was the difference between your expectations when you went into politics versus the reality of being in politics? I have to say that I really didn't have expectations. I'd never been interested in politics, never studied studied poli-sci before, and really just wanted to get into politics to use my background in business and in neurological research to help inform policy, because I knew I understood the research pro process, I knew which questions to ask, and that translation into policy was something that I could do very easily in, in helping my community. Mm -hmm. And the reality has been what? The reality has been that I've been able to do that, but I think when it comes to raising awareness about issues that are very important, um, pushing the status quo and changing culture, I think that that has less to do with the actual policy and regulations and more to do with using my voice within the political process, within this, this atmosphere that I'm in to really raise awareness about issues that are critically important. Um, I've seen Steve uh, do, uh, Steve Pekin do interviews on the show with other parliamentarians. And, mm -hmm. you know, he always stresses how um, difficult the life of a politician can be. Yes. Um, because if you have a family, the travel, all of that. Uh, what sort of toll has being a politician politician taken on your role as a mother, as a wife? You know, I owned a healthcare-based research management firm before I got into politics. So I, I understood the, the demand in terms of having to travel, being away from home, um, not being able to, to tuck my kids in tonight at, at night and missing some key uh, events that happened with them. So I think for, for that part, uh, it hasn't been as bad, and, and it hasn't been as bad because I'm in Whitby. I'm three and a half hours by the 401 away from Ottawa. Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Four hours, depending on who's watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Drive nice and slow. <laughs> um, but for other colleagues, it is much further away. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't take for granted that it is a, a demanding job, and it does take you away from your family, but but not as much as I think some of my other colleagues who live on the West Coast or who, who live in the North. Mm -hmm. They have, a, it is a really grueling schedule, and does, of course, take you away from your family. I mean, also, uh, I think in, in this day and age, we have another layer of being in the public eye that maybe we didn't right. have, like, even five, ten years ago is very yes. different. We now have that social media where politicians do have access yes. to the people that they're <laughs> representing, but uh, statistics show, the data shows, that women, and especially women of color, are targeted online. And I've seen some of the tweets that you've received. And just uh, last month, you received some mail, and I'm actually going to read what it says. Mm -hmm. I've never uttered this word out loud, mm -hmm. um, but I will say it just for the people who are listening in the podcast. And also, I think it's important for people to hear the word itself. Yes. And this was after you announced that you were going to leave the Liberal Caucus, and somebody sent you this. Mm -hmm. uh, and on it, it says, Whippy MP Selena Caesar Chavan quits Liberal Caucus. On it, someone has written, dumb nigger with attitude, entitlement always, head problems, no one gets along with dumb niggers. What did you think when you opened that envelope and stared down at this? Because this was mailed to you and addressed yeah. to you. So I want to be clear with messages like this. I posted this on social media, and I've maybe posted one or two others. This comes to my office on a regular basis. So people were really shocked when this came out. It's like, oh, I can't believe this. this is, you know that this is happening. Uh, this has happened many times, and unfortunately, it's my office staff that opens the mail and, and has to read that, and I get a few pieces of it. But when we talk about the social media component and the anonymity that allows people to put vile, very dangerous rhetoric out in a social media platform where everyone could see, children, my children see it, um, adults see it, good good members of our society see it. I think that is is damaging. That, I think, has pulled away or, or made some of the tissue fiber that I have, the strength in me, fray a little bit. 
because you you get the some of the the worst in people because politics is so division divisive. People are liberal or they're conservative or they're NDP or they're green or they're they're not, mm -hmm. and it's it's so polarizing and they forget all the other factors that make up Selena. And so when I see something like that, first of all, my mama told me that I'm not that. Mm -hmm. So it didn't phase me, but I think we have a responsibility to call it out and put it out on social media so people know there's a historical account of what happened when I was there. How often, as an elect elected politician, did you receive racist remarks or threats via social media or even through the mail? Oh, I would say weekly basis. <laughs> yeah, and more, the more I started talking up about issues, the more it came. So when I talked about my mental health issues, you know, it was more an attack on my character. Well, maybe you shouldn't be there if you can't handle it. Maybe, you know, if you have mental health issues, you should stay at home. Give the job to someone else who can handle it. You do not have thick, thick enough skin. As I started talking about equity and justice and, you know, wearing my braids and, and doing things in, in, ter in terms of gender, race, equity, then it became a an issue of attacking my skin attacking who I am as an individual. And um, the more I did it, the more the attacks came, but that doesn't mean we stop. That doesn't mean we stop having uncomfortable conversations. Because it makes you uncomfortable, we need to have them. Um, yeah, I don't think you're, anyone could uh, say that you're a person that stopped because uh, you've actually, um, with everything that's been going on with the SNC-Lavalin uh, scandal, uh, you sent out a tweet a while ago directed at the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and it got a lot of attention. So yes. at the beginning, I'm going to quote uh, the Prime Minister, but this is what you wrote in the tweet. Yes. His quote, uh, it says, I believe real, real leadership is about listening, learning, and compassion. Central to my leadership is fostering an environment where my ministers, caucus, and staff feel comfortable coming to me when they have concerns, end quote. And then you add, I did come to you recently recently twice remember your reactions. Um, I'm inferring that you were referring to two exchanges you had with the Prime Minister. Absolutely. Um, where you were telling him you weren't going to run in the next election. Mm -hmm. um, and you said in both instances that he, wa he got hostile. Mm -hmm. How was he hostile? So I want to add to that quote. So his quote talked about his leadership and his open environment. And then the next sentence said, and Ms. W Ms. Wilson Rainbow did not come to me. That perception that he gave to Canadians was not my reality. My reality was when I phoned him, when I, I spoke to him on the phone, there was yelling. Mm -hmm. And I reciprocated that. I'm, I'm going to own that. You start yelling at me, I'm going to push back. The area where I think, and, and, and that was the yelling part. So then, then we, we had another meeting, a, a broader meeting, and without disclosing caucus confidentiality, we're talking about trust and building our team and doing what we needed for the greater good of Canadians. And throughout that meeting, I felt really terrible about the exchange that we had. So I wanted to reconcile and say, look, mm -hmm. you know, the meeting that we had wasn't the greatest, and um, you know, let's try to bury the hatchet. And that was met with even more hostility. Mm -hmm. It was the glare. It was the it was the sort of you know, stomping off. And then I, I realized that when he was talking about trust and team and the greater good, he was not referring to me. I need to push back on that because yes. you were once his parliamentary secretary. Absolutely. Um, he is the prime minister. Yeah. Isn't he allowed to be angry when he hears that a member of his team is leaving? Of course, but ask any other member of his team who told him that he was leaving, which I did, mm -hmm. and you can feel free to do that. Ask them what their reaction was. Some of them said the easiest part of my decision was going to talk to the prime minister. Uh, the prime minister completely understood that I was leaving. It was a, it was a great decision and a great discussion. But, but maybe another, um, another way of looking at it mm -hmm. is if he didn't show any emotion and he was like, okay, no, would that, that wasn't. Would, that but was would it. that not be as bad if he was just to be like, okay, see you later? Then like, what was he apologizing for? Then why did he do that? And why did he do that in a way that didn't even bother to call me out of the chamber, but sat, stood behind me or stooped behind me in my chair and said, mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry for how I treated you. Do you apologize to someone by stooping behind them or do what, you look them in the eye? Why do you think that he reacted the way that he did? That's a question you have to ask the prime minister because I've never gotten an answer. And look, I don't have I don't have beef with the prime minister. This is not what this is about. I think this is about the fact that at that particular moment and the moments after, there was not respect enough shown to me as an individual who represents 130,000 people in the town of Whitby. 
those people got him in the position that he's in because they elected me. And if I go to him on any reason, for any circumstance, that requires a degree of respect and understanding for my job and the position that, and the people that I represent that will allow us to be here. We have borrowed jobs. And once we forget how we got here and why we are there, then we're doomed. And that is all about the people. Um, I want to read something from uh, a columnist, uh, Janice Kennedy in the Ottawa Citizen, mm -hmm. um, what she wrote about uh, all this whole situation. For sure. um, Try as I might to discern Trudeau's dark misogynist side, what I see is a leader who is probably about as feminist as he's ever been. Despite all the nasty chaos of the Jody Wilson-Raybould slash Jane Philpott affair, for me, it feminism means righting historical and ongoing wrongs. It also means treating women and men equally. No fair sex nonsense, no special kid gloves. In the current Canadian political context, that means treating Wilson Raybould and Philpott as players who have opted out of the team. Characterizing these two women as victims of big bad male bullying along with Selena Caesar Chavan when she can grab a bit of their spotlight, because after all, Trudeau raised his voice at her, is truly anti-feminist. Whatever happened to equal treatment? What are your thoughts on that? Whatever happened to equal treatment? I mean, that certainly is her is opinion. Is there a bit of uh, fairness in that? That, that is, is, is certainly uh, her opinion on the, on the topic. Again, I would say that the foundation of our democracy is our humanity. It's how we treat people. When we are looking at instilling policies and laws that affect millions of people, 130,000 of which I represent, we need to think about how we do that. And we have to do that in a responsible way. And as prime minister and as member of parliament, sure, I could take it. I didn't get to this position because I can't take it or I don't have mm. thick enough skin. But I think the respect that is due to individuals, whether we're in politics or not, needs to be standardized. It needs to be something that we don't just accept passive aggressive behavior we don't just accept things for the sake of accepting them you've been um i guess it's still uh maybe a little bit of away from the situation looking mm -hmm. back because we have to always do this look mm -hmm. back and say what was my role in this right do you feel like maybe you could have done something differently or do you bear any responsibility in how everything uh came down um there's always things that we could do differently. And when I look back on the situation, I would say that the, and I did put it out there that the interview that I did with the Globe and Mail, um, I think hurt not just uh, my relationship with the prime minister, but my colleagues as well. And so if I were to do something differently, I wouldn't have done that. But at the same time, I need to ensure that I am representing the people who elected me, like I did when I told them that I was running in 2015, when I knocked on their door and I told them that I would be authentic and I would I would stand for something. Mm -hmm. And if I accept that, that kind of behavior, I can't stand up for myself in that situation. How can they have trust in me to stand up for them for anything else? In your view, is the prime minister a feminist? Absolutely. I wouldn't say that he isn't. The situation with me doesn't discredit him from being a feminist. I mean, if we look at the track record of the government mm -hmm. in terms of our feminist international assistance policy, I was parliamentary secretary to the Minister of International Development. That policy not only saved, uh, changed people's lives, it saved lives. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a number of different initiatives brought forward by this government that clearly gem demonstrates that there is a capacity to see women do better economically, socially, and politically. The situation between myself and the prime minister mm -hmm. is one that is, is possibly just unique to me, but it's not one that should be unvalidated or invalidated because somebody thinks that it is a, a decree or an indictment on whether or not he is a feminist. And be, uh, one or thing, me either, for oh, that matter. Well, you've not only left your cabinet post, you also chose to leave the Liberal Party. Uh, mm -hmm. Why did you feel like you had to do that? Because I have to represent the people that I represent and not just the Liberals But the people of Whitby um, elected you as a Liberal member. Absolutely, and not just Liberal members in Whitby. And I know that for a fact. Do you it's, think- It's Conservative members, it was Liberal members. And I think that in order to represent them properly, in the way that I promised them at the door, then being an independent member of parliament mm -hmm. was the way to go. It was also the way to go because I know that my caucus members were not happy. 
And so with you or with the prime with, minister? With, my, with me. And so there's a responsibility to be, at some point, to be the adult in the room and say, look, I'm going to take responsibility for so this. So do you feel like they didn't want you there anymore? I'm, I got a, a sense that there were enough people that were not happy with, with uh, the interview that was done. Um, you've stood up online uh, for uh, Jody Wilson uh, Raybould and uh, Jane Philpott. Um, sure. And they, my impression anyway, is that they didn't want to leave the caucus, but they were uh, kicked out of the caucus by the prime minister. Mm -hmm. um, did they support you in, you know, because I'm getting the impression that if you did have support within the party, you might have stayed? Um, they did. And again, I don't think that. Jane or Jody's support or not support of me would have changed my decision as to whether or not I left. They were still part of caucus mm -hmm. when I left. Um, I think that it was, a, it was a decision that I had to make for my constituents mm -hmm. and also for uh, the good of the party. Um, what is Independence Row? It's the back row of the House of Commons. And who's we're there now? The, we're all the independents sit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's myself, Jody, Jane, Raj, uh, Darshan, Aaron, and Tony Clement. And then there's, of course, the Green Party, the Bloc, and uh, the PPC. Mm. Yes. Well, you know, looking back um, in your time in office, yeah. what do you think has been your biggest accomplishment as an MP? I would say that there, there are a couple of things. The first being raising awareness around mental illness. Um, disclosing that I live with depression and anxiety kicked off a conversation um, about vulnerability, about the ability to speak about and to say your story so and be a little bit vulnerable so others could be a little bit more resilient. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was really important. And then there was an advocacy push around that mm -hmm. uh, within caucus and outside of caucus to ensure that there was a $5 billion announcement in the budget around mental health services for young people. And secondly, I would say raising issues around equity and justice. You know, there are uncomfortable conversations around racism and microaggressions in Canada. And it's not an indictment on our country, but it's a conversation and a story that we need to talk about. And if we're afraid to talk about it because it makes us uncomfortable or we're blinded by the historical facts that this is true, mm. then we're not going to get ahead. You're a handful of women of color in the caucus, or were, was. Um, you once stood up in the house to tell, uh, to talk about, you know, black women should be, how black women should be proud to wear their braids. You spoke about uh, body shaming. Uh, you're now leaving politics entirely. Do you, what do you think that message sends to young black women across Canada, across the world, who are looking to you uh, for inspiration? So I actually felt a little guilty about that. And it was one of the hardest things for me to get over in making the decision to leave. And then I went to Daughters of the Vote. Every year they have Daughters of the Vote on the Hill where they bring 338 women across Canada to Parliament Hill. And I was talking to a group of mainly young black women, but women of, of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And they were inspired. And they said to me, you know, we got next. We, we have this. We know, we see through you what, is, what we're able to do, what can be accomplished. And we're proud. And I was, I was really emotional because I said to them, I said, I thought you would, you would be disenfranchised. I thought you would feel disconnected from the process and jaded by the process, by me leaving. And they said, absolutely not. We're inspired. We want to do this. We want to make change. But like I said in my statement when I left, when I said I was no longer going to run, I want women to run, but run in packs, run with the ability to support each other and stand with each other and, and really uh, don't just believe her and stand with her when it's convenient, but believe her and stand with her when it's not. When it's uncomfortable. When it's uncomfortable. Um, the, uh, one more question. We only have a few seconds left. Uh, yes. The election is just a few months away. Um, and one of the, the criticisms that I've seen uh, lobbed at you uh, is that you know your actions, uh, calling out the prime minister, will hurt his chances uh, when it comes to the election in October. Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. 
I think people are going to make their decisions based, if they're making the decisions on one person calling out the prime minister as opposed to policy, as opposed to looking at the platform, as opposed to looking at the past record of the government, as opposed to looking at the past record of other uh, other governments and seeing and comparing and contrasting what has been done versus what was said to be done versus what they were projecting to going to, do, going to be doing, mm -hmm. then if I have that much power to... to to change an election, people need to pay attention to what's actually written on the ground and make their decision as to to vote for based on record. Selena, really appreciate you making time for the agenda and uh, very excited to see what you do next. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.